Okay, we're moving on now to the next stage of analysis. That is the shell code that we've extracted from the RTF document. So if you missed the analysis from the video preceding, I would uh, encourage you to maybe hit pause here and, and go check that out. If you're just interested in how to analyze this first stage shell code, uh, well then here we are. So um, just to back up a bit, we, we identified this location as our entry point. This certainly looks like the correct location. We have a call followed by a pop. So that is a, a normal position independence technique for shellcode to figure out where it is in memory. Um, and from here, uh, you know, you, I, you know, I tend to tend to like resist the temptation to analyze all of this code. I'm looking for patterns. Um, this looks like all valid disassembly. It looks like we have a normal flow and only do things start to look a little bit odd when we get to this, what, you know, what would be after this, this looping structure, as you can see, that moves um, kind of up into the right here. Uh, why does this look odd? Well, not only do we have this red line indicated that Ida ran into some problem with, with analysis, but if you look at the next basic block, um, the sequence of instructions here just doesn't make any sense. They're very nonsensical. So this is usually a pretty good indication that we're dealing with obfuscated code that Ida just simply tried to disassemble because there was a flow that directed it here. Um, so what I will typically do at this point, set a breakpoint where I think the deobfuscation loop should be finished, which is right here, uh, and then take just take note of these bytes, right? So we have a 0EF7B2. Now, because our shell code is wrapped in a PE file, we can debug it. So hit play, select yes. We should hit our entry point, or our breakpoint, I'm sorry, uh, and you can see we've got different bytes. So pretty good indication here that we are now um, on our way to uh, analyzing this, this layer of deobfuscated code. Now, Ida can have a little bit of trouble just because uh, the bytes change during runtime. So you can use the D key to convert code to data. And yeah, this things can get a little bit hard to follow here. So I'm gonna go to the linear mode, go back to where EIP is pointing to, uh, you can use C to convert back to code. And sometimes you have to go through this process of um, undefining and redefining in order to make sense of actually what's going on here. Uh, so here we have a sub ESP and then there's a call. So we can step into the call. Uh, and now you can continue to trace through this code, kind of cleaning up the output here as you go in order to understand a little bit better um, you know, what the actual instructions are. You may also notice, so this is kind of gonna put us into easy mode, now that we have this layer of shell code, that first layer of shell code deobfuscated, um, we can see pretty much everything we need to see based off of these strings. So there was no further attempt uh, to obfuscate the strings as part of the shell code and its anti-analysis. So we have different libraries and different methods that are gonna be called. And you know the most important here likely is the URL download to file. We have this URL um, and we wanna be able to now, uh, now we can pretty much recognize that the content from this location is going to be downloaded to the file system, likely temp name.exe, uh, and then it's going to be executed before the shell code exits, right? So um, when I'm in quick mode, like I'm going to take these, you know, these artifacts, these strings, and just run with it. Um, and then at some point when I have a little bit more time, perhaps go through and, and just like actually trace through all the shell code to have you know, kind of concrete and definitive analysis and results. Because I want to be able to, to confidently say, yes, it's just one URL in the shell code. It writes to this one location in the file system. It tries to execute it, and then it exits. Um, but to get this next stage, uh, we can now use this hex view. 401380 is the virtual address that starts the sort of hex view, this row. Uh, and the H is at this offset. It's hex 68. So you can see here. Um, this would be at an offset or column of seven. So 401387, we can actually just go there up in the disassembly view. You'll see Ida hasn't disassembled any of that code yet because um, the, the CPU hasn't gone there. We could, you could also, if you go to options general, uh, prompt a reanalysis. So here's reanalyze the program and that sometimes can help. In this case, it doesn't appear to be. Uh, so we can just hit the D key to create, um, sort of undefine that D word. And now we can go to where that H begins at 8.7. 7. 
And then one way to get this content is just a little clunky. I'm sure there's a better way. I just couldn't come up with anything going into this video. Um, is just to highlight all of the instructions here. And you can see it's really easy to go too far. There we go. And then if you go to edit and export data, that used to be a shortcut key. I'm not sure what happened to it, but uh, there you have the raw bytes. And you can take that to something like CyberChef and I'll just do a from hex and a decode text, and there you go. There's where that payload is coming from. Okay, so um, I've already grabbed this. I'll also include this uh, link to this payload in the uh, video description, so that way if you want to grab this next stage, you can. Um, you know, Normally, though, at this point, if you have access to request these from the Internet, I do. I download it so that I can, well, I check to see if it's still available, and if so, then I download it so I can continue my analysis. Um, if you can't do that, let's say you're, you're working in an isolated environment or you just simply can't connect to the internet, then you might run into a dead end here and this is the most analysis you can do. Um, there are risks associated with downloading the payload. The adversary may be watching, looking um, for download requests. This is commodity stuff though and so I'm not too worried uh, on a personal level uh, reaching out through, you know, reaching out to the host, um, not from my analysis environment, like I use systems that hopefully are, are non-traceable essentially. Okay, so in the next video then, we'll continue our analysis and take a look at this file.